There's something about the idea of kingship that really has a hold on us. You know, even here in America, where we fought a whole war to overthrow a king and made a conscious decision to establish ourselves as a democracy rather than as a monarchy to prevent a, a tyrannical king from coming into power, even here, the idea of kingship is still really attractive, especially a good, benevolent king. And that's why we all love stories of, of King Arthur, you know, which has been popular for hundreds and hundreds of years, um, or the modern day stories of, of good kings like Lord of the Rings with Theoden and Aragorn, or High King Peter in Narnia. Um, and of course, there are historical examples of good kings, benevolent monarchs, uh, some of which the uh, the church has even uh, declared saints like uh, King Wenceslas of Poland or King, um, King Stephen of Hungary or King Louis of France. And of course, there's the biblical examples of King Solomon and King David. Um, what is it that we find appealing about these particular kings, right? Not just that they weren't cruel like, um, like dictators are, and it's not just that they were efficient administrators, good governors, um, or, or smart generals or anything like that. Um, what they all have in common is they conducted themselves um, knowing that their authority that they had didn't derive from within themselves. It was not a prideful authority. They didn't rule over people because they were stronger or better or smarter or wiser. They received the authority that they had from an even higher authority. They recognized that yes, they were kings, but there was a standard of kingship to which they must conform and by which they would be judged. And what that higher standard of kingship is, is what we celebrate in the, the great solemnity of Christ the King that the church gives us here at the end of ordinary time. That standard of kingship is Christ himself. Our Lord Jesus Christ shows us what it means to be a true benevolent king. He, he shows us that a good king doesn't rule like a dictator or like a tyrant um, or even like an administrator, but a good king rules like a father. You know, think of the kind of dad that like any of us would, would want growing up. You know, someone who's stern when he has to be stern uh, to keep us in line, but who above all just cares for us and wants to, to, to do everything that he does uh, for our good, for the sake of our well-being, and, and wants to protect us and would, if need be, even give his life for us. This is how a good king conducts himself, and this is how Christ conducted himself. This is what we see on the cross, is our king giving his life to protect us, his, his citizens, yes, but also his children, also his children. He reigns as a father reigns. And, and we see this exemplified in the real life examples of good kings and also in the, the stories, the legends, and the myths that we tell where we imagine what, what a good king would be. These are all icons, all models of the ultimate high king, which is Jesus Christ. And so it's fitting that at the end of ordinary time, the last Sunday of ordinary time, as we end our liturgical year, the church gives us this great solemnity of Christ the king, because this is truly the end of all things. This is what it's pointing towards, that, that great time, that eschaton, when everything will be made subject to his reign. Everything will fall under his loving, benevolent, fatherly care, including you and I. Um, and when we find ourselves subject to a king like this, a king who loves us, a king who's willing to give his life to protect us, this is a king that we not only fear, that we not only respect, that we not only want to honor and serve, but this is a king for whom we would give our lives. And so we see this evidenced in the martyrs, who are those who did just that, who would give their lives for the sake of, uh, of their high king. And the beautiful thing is, this is our end as well, not, uh, not merely the end of the universe, the end of all things, but we have a participation in that. It's our personal end for you and I. We're called to share in his kingdom. Um, and, and the even more spectacular thing is this keeps getting better and better, is that we share in his kingdom not just as, uh, as citizens, not just as sons and daughters or even brothers and sisters of Christ, but we share in his reign as well. 
just like um, you know, Peter was high king of Narnia, but his siblings, Edmund and Lucy and Susan, were also kings and queens under him. You and I are called to be kings and queens under Christ, sharing in his reign. You know, and this is, you know, we see this in the, in the rosary, the great prayer that we pray uh, as Catholics to meditate on the life of Christ. You know, we have all the mysteries of the rosary, and we begin with the joyful mysteries um, about his incarnation and the luminous mysteries where we meditate upon, you know, uh, his ministry on earth, including his proclamation of the kingdom. And then there's the sorrowful mysteries where we meditate upon his passion, his giving his life for us. And then finally, we get to the end, the glorious mysteries where we meditate on his resurrection and his ascension into heaven uh, and the descent of the Holy Spirit. But then how do the glorious mysteries end? They end with the coronation of the Blessed Virgin Mary, Christ placing a crown on the head of his mother, the High King crowning his queen. Mary is the model of the church. What she has now in its fullness, we hope to one day participate in. You and I will share in the reign of Christ the King, right? We, we as human beings made in the image and likeness of God, the king of the universe, we also are kings and queens of the universe under him. This is our glorious destiny. This is what awaits all of those who persevere in Christ, all of those who would have Christ as our high king. Praise be Jesus Christ.